Hi everyone, it's Dr. Romani and welcome to this YouTube channel on narcissism, narcissistic abuse, narcissistic relationships. So I was reading an advice column in a very popular big newspaper and all I could say was, oh my goodness, no wonder people are struggling with narcissistic abuse. So there's a column in the New York Times called The Ethicist. And in this column, the writer gives advice to people who are going through what are supposed to be sort of ethical dilemmas in their lives. Things like a friend's friend said racist things. Do you call them out? Do you not invite them to another dinner party? Do you skip their wedding? That kind of thing, like sort of values and how to proceed through human relationships, right? I'd say in this column about every other week, the questions are about toxic relationships someone in a family in a relationship engaging in emotional abuse of some kind and the person writing the letter is may not always be in the relationship but maybe a friend or a supporter seeking some guidance on how to navigate the situation the ethicist is not a shrink or a social worker he is some philosophy teacher or some philosopher dude. He might be useful in situations where the situation is like, if my mother dies and one of my siblings has a history of mental illness and can't work, is it fair if that sibling gets more of the estate? Something like that could be argued philosophically. But in my estimation, it's dangerous to try to argue emotional and narcissistic abuse in that way. And I have to say maybe 40, 50% of the time this philosopher dude kind of gets it rightish. But most often, because he doesn't seem to understand narcissism, coercive control, enabling, gaslighting, manipulation, invalidation, trauma bonding, his answers actually do come up short. And that can be really problematic. The real money shot on this ethicist column, though, is the comments. His philosophical frame often means that he thinks he's being circumspect, seeing all the positions, being clear on everyone's point of view, respecting family traditions and boundaries, that kind of thing, right? He comes at it very analytically, very logically. But who, those comments, oh my goodness. When I read those, because those are just people chiming in, I am reminded why surviving narcissistic abuse is so difficult. So to think about this video, I went back through the four most recent questions in this column that had an emotional abuse theme. The commenter said things ranging from, oh, well, I just think people are too judgmental these days. Sometimes people say things they don't mean. Get over it. One time doing something bad wasn't abuse except that the person was saying this has been happening for years. And then someone else said, well, people just want marriages to end and people are just against marriage and marriage is so great. Not for everyone. Then there are the survivor blamers. Well, she's choosing to stay. Maybe she has to take responsibility for that choice. Or they'll blame the survivor for turning to friends for advice, saying that nobody should talk about family problems outside of the family. But the family is abusive, so who are you going to talk to? Then there are the others who say that, well, we don't know the other person's side of it. My family accused me of being a psychological abuser, and then they weren't nice to me when I went to therapy. I said sorry. On and on and on, hundreds of comments that at least half the time, maybe even more, thought that the person that was experiencing the abuse in these questions was weak, Weak-willed, wanting attention, wanting sympathy, being too needy, asking too much of friends, didn't recognize relationships or work, and that there are two sides to everything. And I was like, wow. So before I sort of sat down and thought about this video, I had read one question that sort of pushed me, pushed me too far in this column. So I put myself through about 30 to 60 minutes. It was a waste of time in some ways, but I did. I'm scrolling through these comments, and afterwards... I have to tell you, I just wanted to put my head in my hands and cry. It was then I, I once again recognized why survivors feel that it is so hopeless, that there is so little support out in the world. I knew it, but seeing the words of so many strangers was just a wow. It's important for me to not gaslight survivors. I get it. If this is the sentiment of the world, how can you really feel safe telling friends or family who apparently feel really put upon because you're the one being harmed in a psychologically cruel relationship. Basically, you're an inconvenience because you're being emotionally abused.
This idea that people can just leave a relationship is a very privileged and, yeah, privileged mindset. It doesn't account for money, safety, employability, and affordability, especially if a person has children. It doesn't account for the lack of societal power that people have. Why don't you leave? Why don't you leave? It's such a disrespectful question. Here's a question for you. How about we ask the abusers, why don't you leave? Instead of breaking someone down and manipulating and gaslighting them, why don't you just go because you think this person isn't good enough for you? Instead of abusing this person, why don't you leave? We already know the question. Another question that's even more important is why do you abuse? We're never going to get the answer to that one. We also know it's not that simple. The capacity of anyone who has a narcissistic personality to shapeshift, to be what the world needs, and then turn into something very different also means that survivors are not believed. Heck, you barely believe it yourself and you're the one in the relationship. Everyone says it's just a nice guy. Sadly, people with big platforms like writers for the New York Times are people with privilege and societal power. From that high altitude, it can be easy to never have to learn about trauma bonding and what happens to people who have no power or people in abusive relationships of any kind. The confusion in economic system that can make it impossible to leave. Listen, I'm based in Los Angeles and the cost of rent is enough to mean that lots of people in narcissistic relationships have to stay and they say, This is taking years off of my life, but I simply cannot afford to leave. This is one of those sad, depressing videos where I just don't have an answer. Just when I get hopeful and think that these conversations that I have on YouTube or with podcasts anywhere else, when I think they're getting somewhere, I recognize that the dismissive judgment of so many in the world, especially when it's manifested in the smarty smart types of people that read the New York Times, mean that most survivors, unless they can afford therapy with a really good therapist who understands narcissistic abuse and be able to keep going to that therapy, most people will never get the support they need. This channel is never going to be a substitute for therapy, but I do hope that every so often it's a source of validation and a place where the gaslighting gets turned off. Just one look at those comments is once again a reminder of how real it is. And even if the world refuses to recognize it, even if recognizing that there are such a thing as narcissistic and toxic relationships because it punctures their convenient versions of relationships and families, whatever all that is, let me remind you, this is real. Thanks again.